Um, I'm glad to have the pleasure of introducing our opening keynote speaker for this year's conference. And I just, I had some chance to talk with him, and I think you are going to thoroughly enjoy his presentation. So joining us today is Michael Angelo Caruso. Michael teaches leaders and salespersons how to be better presenters. He's a valued communication consultant to companies and organizations all over the world. Michael has delivered over 2,000 presentations and keynote speeches on five continents and in 49 of 50 states. He's an internationally recognized expert on the subjects of leadership, selling, and improved customer service. His keynotes have been called a crafty mix of monologue, interviews, and group therapy. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Michael Angelo Caruso. I like to sit in the aisle seats on airplanes. You too? And often on airplanes, I play the same game you do as people are getting on board. I, I'm trying to guess who's sitting next to Michael today. <laughs> and a beautiful woman walked on the plane, walks, starts walking down the aisle, and I thought, I wonder if it's her. Nope. And then a large gentleman got on the plane, super-sized guy. I thought, I wonder if I'm sitting next to him today. Nope. And then I heard my seatmate before I saw him the reason I heard him is because he was talking on the cell phone. You probably notice people talk on cell phones a lot louder than they do in, with normal voice. Why do we do that? Anybody know? So I heard him approach my seat. He's talking to a child, apparently, and the child is being left home, left home and daddy's traveling, so he's explaining to the son, you're nodding your head like you go through this yourself. Uh, he's explaining to his son why he's traveling. Uh, and then he stops at my row, and because he's talking to his son, he simply says to me, <clears throat> which I take to mean, I'm seated next to you. So I stand up to clear the way for him to get in. And he's got an overhead that he shoves into the bin upstairs. He's got another bag that goes underneath, and I see the luggage tag on both of the items. I recognize the name of the company that he works at. I'm flying out of Detroit Metropolitan Airport. He apparently works in Michigan, so I see the luggage tags. Little information, okay, good. He sits down in the window seat, and I join him. And now he's talking to a second child that doesn't want to say goodbye to dad. This continues, now there's a third child screaming into the phone so loud, I can hear the kid. And daddy is just crestfallen. You know how dads get when, uh, when they get overwhelmed, they just shut down, and he's having trouble coping with this. And I just feel for the guy, you know, I don't have any children, but I feel for his situation. They finally announced that the boarding door is going to be closing, which is now going to force my new friend to actually hang up on one of his children. <laughs> Again, some heads nodding in the room, you've been there. And uh, he says, look, honey, I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. And, and the flight attendant forces him to hang up the phone. and. And he puts the phone in his lap and he sighs as if the weight of the world is leaving his shoulders. And I turned to him and I said, Daddy's leaving home, huh? And he said to me, Oh, you were listening. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, How could I not? <laughs> and he said, Yeah, my kids do not like it when I leave home. I said, How many children do you have? He says, Three. I said, How old are they? He said, Four, five, and seven. I said, Wow, what are their names? He said, well, we gave them S names. Sandy, Sally, and Scotty. Scotty's the oldest, and he was the one that was crying the loudest. I said, I can't imagine, man, it's tough. And you're flying for work? I noticed the name of your company on your bags. He said, yeah, I work for so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I travel a lot with them. I said, well, what's a lot? He said, I'm gone 15 to 17 days a month, and so I'm away from home a lot. And I said, well, well oh my gosh, I said, that's, a lot of travel. I said, um, what, what do you do that you have to travel so much? He said, well, I'm a sales manager and I have to go out and make sure my people are working a full day. 
And then he got a very strange expression on his face. You probably have, have experienced this when you're talking with people. He got kind of this ugly, strange, contorted look, and he says, he says to me, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. Now, he's not sorry he didn't get my name. He's sorry he's given a complete stranger so much personal information. <laughs> and now it's time to play catch up. So he says, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. And I held out my hand first because I read a long time ago that the person who holds out their hand first has influence in any interaction. And I said, my name's Michelangelo Caruso. He starts shaking my hand and he said, Michelangelo Caruso, that's a fantastic name. I said, I, I said, he said to me, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I teach sales managers how to get their people to work a full day. <laughs> says, can I have a car? Yeah. <laughs> and the lady in front of us says, I want one too. <laughs> Did you like my opening story? Yeah. <laughs> so we're here today to talk about first impressions and how they work. And um, I think you're going to really enjoy this presentation because I know that you meet a lot of people in your lives that are important to you. And I know that we're all kind of getting back into the swimming pool again, and it's time maybe for a little refresher course on this. And I want to thank Kara and Denise and Amber for being so nice to me on the way in. I, I do have a really good program planned for you. It is educational, but I hope also to entertain you a little bit and, and get you to forget your troubles for a few minutes because you deserve it. Uh, quick question before I get started. How many of you have met some people from the conference already? Hands up if you've met some people, other than the people you traveled with. Okay, excellent. Wow, look at all the hands. How many of you have people have met 10 people or less? When I say meet, real conversations, shook their hand or fist bump, you actually got to know them for a few minutes. 10 or less, how many? Excellent. How many did 25 or less? 25 or less. So we, is that our threshold, 10? <laughs> I know, it's okay. It's okay. So, and I hope you get to meet many, many more people uh, during the conference. But I, wanna, I ask these questions not, not to judge, but to, because I'm fascinated with first impressions. I have been for a long, long time. And I study it. I mean, I've written about it. I, I've got hundreds of YouTubes out there about speaking and what first impressions mean and how to make the most of them. And I, it's been my pleasure to teach thousands of people all over the place how to do it better. So if you're interested, um, I'm happy to help today. Most of us would like to do better with first impressions, but amazing first impressions require a special combination of circumstances. It helps to have some skill, would you agree? It helps to have some psychology and understand how it works. It helps to have a little bit of luck and it also helps to have a sense of adventure. And by adventure, I mean risk-taking, because putting yourself out there, even for one person, imagine doing it through a room of 250 or 300 people. But I know it's hard to do it in, a, in the coffee line with somebody you don't know. And so there is a, an element of risk and adventure because something could go wrong. Now, you could say, well, it's not wrong with a capital W, it's just a small little thing could go wrong. But it's interesting to me, we are less inclined, we are, we are less inclined to introduce ourselves to strangers, even at a conference, than we are to not introduce ourselves, or to introduce ourselves. And you can check this theory tomorrow morning. I, my experience is it gets better by day three, but on day one of the conference, we're strangers. On day three of the conference, you see somebody with a lanyard, they're your friend. So why are we different on day three than day one? Are we different people or is our perception different? Do we feel safer? Is it less risky on day three? Let's talk about it. And let's also figure out how we can use first impressions in our day-to-day -day lives, even in what we're doing for work that would improve our situation, bring richer relationships to us, maybe even introduce opportunities that wouldn't all be uncovered to us if we didn't put ourselves out there. What kind of risk am I talking about when I say we're avoiding first impressions more than we should? How about that street in your neighborhood that you always drive by, but never down? We all have a street like that in our neighborhood. That, that time everyone in your group went swimming except you because the hotel, or the hotel, because the uh, water was too cold. 
right? Risk. That casual friend that we have uh, make a promise to have coffee with, but it never materializes. And that co-employee that you've worked with for seven years but haven't really got to know yet. Why not? <coughs> a little background on where I come from. Uh, and Denise, thank you for the nice introduction. Prior to all of that, I was in a touring rock band with my brothers for almost 10 years. So I spent my 20s on the road, opening for acts like Rick Springfield, Corey Hart, Joan Jett, anybody know these names? Yeah. <laughs> I'm speaking to audiences now that say, Joe who? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, our group featured, and we're on YouTube too, the Caruso Brothers, if you wanna laugh, go find them. But we played uh, a lot of pop music and we had uh, four part harmonies, and harmonies are hard to sing, especially four part. I don't know how much you know about music. And uh, we used to laugh and say to ourselves, the only way we're not gonna hit any more wrong notes is if we stop singing altogether. Yeah. Because trying to sing harmony is guaranteed risk. Mm -hmm. It's guaranteed bad notes. Again, we're talking about this risk, reward, ratio. R, R, R. I'm gonna reference it over and over and over again. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you to a place with risk reward ratio in your personal lives where hopefully at the end of my session, you'll say, you know what, I can do this. I, I can do it. it is, and it's my best interest to do it. And before we do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about your industry because I know the risk reward ratio in your industry in some cases speaks loudly, more loudly to you than what's going on in your personal lives. So I'll show you ways that you can whitewater this adventure of first impressions, even in an industry where you're communicating in, you're communicating with people who are often ill, fraught with emotion, and otherwise not themselves. I know you don't see people at their best sometimes, and that makes first impressions even more challenging. What is it like to be serving someone who doesn't want to see you? I can't imagine, and you have to overcome that. I have such a high level of respect for everyone in this room, and even more so after COVID. I know that you're, uh, I've gotten to know some of you as I prepared for this talk, and I know that you're passionate, dedicated people, you care deeply about what you do for a living, you care deeply about your fellow human beings. And I know that you work in a difficult, ever-changing industry. I don't know if you heard there was a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, you'll read about it. <laughs> um, so, I'm also aware that nurse practitioners in the big, you know, in the org chart of things, they get crap from above and below. I know you're in the middle. And so, th what I'm about to share with you will be very useful. So, I want to begin our conversation today talking about two conditions that behavioral psychologists have identified. They're real, and uh, they were new to me, so I'm assuming they're gonna be new to you, but we're gonna talk about them in terms that you can use them right now. You will use them on the way out of this room today. I promise you that. And the first term is called apophenia. Some of you, anybody know apophenia? I'm just curious. Apophenia happens when one of us, you, us, see two situations, right? And we perceive a connection between those two situations. But here's the catch. There ain't no connection. You see two things happen and you assume they're related and they're not. The other term is the opposite. It's called randomania. I got a kick out of that, rando, like rando. Randomania is the opposite. Two things are connected and you can't tell. Now that's interesting to me because I've said for a long time, one of the problems with human beings, you know this, oh, there's a squirrel and shiny object thing is that we see stuff that's not there, and then we can't see stuff that's right in front of us. It happens all the time, and nobody is immune to this. It happens to all of us. So, an example of apophenia, bringing it to our house today, is that we would go out to the reception, and you would think about exercising something I just told you to do, which is go meet more people, man. And you see somebody outside, but they avert their glance right as you're moving toward them. And you assume, in apophenia, that because they, they averted their glance, therefore, they don't care to meet you. You understand how that's unrelated, right? Why did they avert their glance? So they heard a noise on the other side of the room and they wanted to see what it was. Uh, they were moving away from you anyway, right at that moment. 
they're on their way to the cheese dip, whatever. <laughs> it had nothing to do with you. They just averted their glands. And randomania is someone outside averts their glands and you miss that cue and you go meet them anyway and force yourself on them, right? <laughs> and we all do this. We miss, it's called reading the room and we miss it. Okay. Books have been written about this topic. Any Malcolm Gladwell fans in the room? Malcolm Gladwell, huge author, thank you very much. So his second book, you wanna check it out, is called Blink. And he talks about, in Blink, how human beings, rational people, make big decisions based on precious little intel, right? It's called the guess. We do it with big things, and we do it even more with little things. So I also connect the dots, right? I'm also trying to put things together all the time. This is what consultants do. And uh, so I tripped on this book. It, there was a New York Times book review on a, a book titled, You Bet Your Life, From Blood Transfusions to Max Vaccination, The Long and Risky History of Medical Innovation. I read this book review while I'm preparing for this talk. You see how the, it jumped out at me because I'm getting ready to talk to a bunch of cool nurse practitioners. The author is Paul Offit. And what he's talking about essentially, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, risk in the medical field. So he, he takes an interesting tack. He starts with the Hippocratic Oath, which is of course, first do no harm. And he begins by saying, well that's not exactly true. We harm people all the time in medicine. Not on purpose, of course, but it happens. If we never harmed anybody, we'd never have any breakthroughs. All in favor say aye. I mean, it sounds like a terrible thing to say, but if we never harmed anybody, we'd never have some of the major breakthroughs that we celebrate today, the things that make our job so easy today. I wanna to talk about three of those things with you. The first one is anesthesia. Anesthesia has a very checkered past. In 1840, a carnival barker, <laughs> this is where it starts, a carny, <laughs> In 1840, named Gardner Colton was charging 25 cents a hit for something called NO, or what he called laughing gas. This is in 1840, everybody. Four years later, in 1844, a dentist by the name of Horace Wells attended the show, the carnival, and the next day became the first person to be administered NO because he had a fellow dentist give it to him for a procedure, and it worked. It also worked on Horace Wells' next 15 patients. He was so excited that he had this big medical breakthrough that he arranged a live demo at a place called Massachusetts General Hospital. They have a big theater there at the time. So he does this live demo and there's a big to-do about it and it's a disaster, man. The NO does not work. The patient's wailing, the uh, audience is terrified, the, the press writes about it like it was a, you know, the worst spectacle ever, and Wells' reputation was ruined. That was in 1844. Two years later, a dentist by the name of William Morton demonstrated ether in the same theater with great success. He was so successful, it's actually now called the Ether Dome at Massachusetts Gen. The year after that, this is progress, right? But we're harming people at the same time. Risk, reward, ratio. In 1947, a Scottish doc named James Young Simpson experimented with something called chloroform. It was more potent than ether and didn't cause vomiting. Thumbs up. 15 years later, flash forward 15 years, and chloroform is still killing over 100 people a year in the United States. Terrible thing, but progress. So unfortunately, people were being harmed by various forms of anesthesia for decades while the health industry was figuring it out. And we wouldn't have these systems in place today without all that trial and error. So I'm taking you someplace here. I'm gonna cover a few medical examples because you practice risk-reward ratio in your vocation. Can you learn to practice it more efficiently as a person. Let's talk about the tragic history of heart transplants, ladies and gentlemen. In 1964, the first heart transplant was performed by a Dr. James Hardy, 
who put a chimpanzee's heart into the chest of a guy named Boyd Rush. Mr. Rush died two days, sorry, two hours later. Three years later, famously, Dr. Christian Barnard, who studied him in school, transplanted the first human heart. The patient survived 18 days. And here's this Caruso guy connecting the dots again. I had the good fortune of interviewing a lady named Dean Roars. That's her first name, D-E-A-N. Dean was an early nurse practitioner who was invited to scrub in on the Barnard heart transplant. What the heck? And I got the interviewer on my podcast. This was a long time ago, before I knew I was going to be with you guys. So it's a fascinating story, a fascinating connection. The next year, 1968, because we think we're going to get into the heart plant transplant business now, right? People are setting up companies and buying stock and all this kind of stuff in 1968. In 1968, 100 plus heart transplants were performed around the world, but half the patients died within a month and only 10% were alive two years later. Heart transplants were hard to figure out, and the risk was just too great. Two years later, in 1970, you'd expect more heart transplants. There were only 16. So it was 100 plus around the world in 68. Now we're down to 16. And in 1971, only 17. Too much risk, not enough reward. You with me? Today, in your world, about 2,300 successful heart transplants are performed annually. You know this. And you're probably aware that 85 to 90% of this year's recipients are living at least one year after surgery with an annual death rate of about 4% thereafter. That's pretty good. It's not risk-free. We're still hurting people, but at pretty good odds. The three-year survival rate approaches 75%, and the average recipient survival time about 15 years. Holy crap, that's great. You bought people 15 years, it's fantastic. One more piece, and this one's relevant, can't have a conference without talking about vaccines. We celebrate a guy by the name of Jonas Salk, don't we? He was a hero. Inventor of one of the first polio vaccines, but in some cases his vaccine, as you know, probably caused polio in a lot of kids, temporarily paralyzing tens of thousands of children. Trying to help them, we hurt them. Risk, reward, ratio. And of course, one of the big debates during the COVID-19 pandemic, it was fascinating to me, and I'm not even in your field, so I know you were scratching your head, was, are the vaccines safe enough yet? There are people in this room that haven't decided, and it's okay, it's a personal choice. There were endless discussions about the effectiveness of various vaccines, and what percentage was good enough for the FDA to approve and good enough for you to approve for your kids. It turns out, of course, none of the vaccines were ever 100% effective, which means there was always an element of risk, always, and probably so moving forward. There were lots of risky business in the early days of medicine, including antibiotics, x-ray, and of course, chemotherapy. So what's the moral? What did we learn from the author's book that we can apply in first impressions in the hallway at the conference? Well, first of all, in medicine, we achieve progress in fits and starts. It's kind of how it is with relationships, too. Everybody you meet is not going to be your new BFF. They're going to be some flat tires out there. <laughs> not in this room, of course. <laughs> Tragedies? cannot be prevented no matter how many regulations are put in place. We learn over time and can only hope to manage the risk. You with me? But here's off its biggest point, and this is most interesting to me because it brings it home to us right now in terms of first impression and meeting people and developing relationships here in real time, is that he says we have something in our sensitive world today called precautionary principle. And the precautionary principle says, we, we give favor to a high degree of risk aversion. A much higher degree maybe than we should. So the very, very trait that restrain, restrains progress in medicine and communication, we would apply in our personal lives. We would say, we're not gonna take any risk. We don't want any forward motion. 
I'm not going to put myself out there and try to talk to 10 people tonight at the reception. It's too uncomfortable for me. I'm not going to do it. So we've always heard about uh, risk and reward, and, and we, we've always done it in, in terms of trackable data. We always look at it that way. But can we do it in our personal lives? Let's talk about that. I want to talk to you right now about something called the first 15 seconds, which I've done a deep study on. It's the very first few seconds of a first impression. So when you meet somebody for the first time, and by the way, if you work with somebody and you see them every two or three days, you have a first impression every time you meet them, every time you see them. Right? Is he in a good mood today? Did she get some sleep last night? Is, uh, is she over that thing she was talking about last week? <laughs> Whatever. Right? What, you know, which, which Rick am I getting today? You know, you get that with some people. So let's think about these specific opportunities where we can make more from first impressions. Um, think, about, um, think about this. How many times now have you met somebody and they put a video camera on you, the camera phone. How many of you have this experience where you're having a first impression and you're on camera? Do you do that? Do people do it with you? No? Okay. That's, like, that's like performance art, man. That's impression. As if first impressions aren't hard enough. How about this, remembering names. How many of you would like to be better at remembering names? Hands up. Yeah, it's a big one, right? And you know, the, the uh, secret word, everybody's favorite word, is their own name. So to the extent that you can do this, you get better at first impressions automatically. And yet there are people in this room that have been around, around for several decades, still haven't gotten the whole remember names thing down. I'm gonna help you with that. I have a technique for you. you you'll find it very, very useful. We'll do it in Q&A, is that okay? I'll move it over. Um, and also being the first person to reach out, which I talked about earlier. Now, I don't know if we're shaking hands at this conference, it doesn't really matter. When I say reach out, I mean initiate the interaction, right? I had a chance to meet somebody who turns out to be from our town in Rochester today, and uh, I happened to be walking by her table and I reached out, I think first, and I said, how are you? And I, I can't remember what I said, what was the line? Oh, you asked. You're early, or something. You did say that. Yeah, you're early. Yeah, you made it. I mean, it's nothing line, right? Nothing. I could have said, you look nice today. Thank you for coming. I could have said, where are you from? I just happened to say, you're early. And now she's seated at, seated at our table. You see how this works? She was over there. Mm. You could have met her. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe later. All right, so initiating that hello, and an old early trick of mine that I do all the time, but it's easier said than done, I promise you, is I'm in a buffet line, and I introduce myself to the person behind me. And when I do this, we're talking in regular voices. Eventually, this person turns around to see what's going on behind me. And I, that's when I meet that person. And I meet people in the buffet line. And I know this is unusual. <laughs> and you're already backing up, man. I don't want to meet people. I just wash my hands, Michael. <laughs> How about first impressions on Zoom? which you're gonna be doing for a while, or in email, or on social media, or in text. You wanna set somebody back on their heels in a text when they send you an email, a text first thing in the morning and it's really cold and direct? Text back, good morning. Good morning. And then wait. It's almost like it's Pavlovian, you know, like you owe them an answer, but you're not going to give it until they say good morning to you. And it resets the playing field, man, right? It's the great equalizer, etiquette. Don't let people take you to some place where you're not comfortable. Good morning. Okay. And then, of course, being the first one to speak up in a group meeting or a Q&A segment, uh, having done so many presentations, <laughs> Denise. I can promise you, nobody wants to ask the first question at Q&A. Do we have any speakers in the room? Anybody that does presentation? Probably a few. Have you done Q&A and, and it's time for Q&A but everybody sits there and nobody wants to ask? You want a trick for that? You ask the first question. Yeah, I know. Well, it's, a, it's a human trait, right? The audience doesn't want to be the first. So here's the trick. You keep a ringer question in your back pocket and when you get crickets, any questions? crickets, 
you know, one question I hear all the time at this point in the program is, and then I'm the first one to ask the question. Now they get to ask the second question. Works like a charm. Okay. So let's talk now about the 15 most powerful words that you can use. You can certainly use them anytime, but if you use them in a first impression, they're super, super powerful. And uh, you're gonna have to write them down. You're never gonna remember them. Again, there's video about it. Michelangelo Caruso, 15 words. It'll come up on YouTube. But write them down just for now so you can kind of let them ruminate. And um, uh, as I talk about the 15 most important words to use in a first impression, remember that all words have what's called a denotation and a connotation. You know this? How do you remember? The denotation is the dictionary definition, D, D. That's how you remember. But the connotation is what everyone thinks the word means. You with me? I'll give you a quick example. Does the word boss have a positive or negative connotation? Negative. Most people would say negative. Good. Does the word coach have a positive or negative connotation? Positive. Positive. So now you understand the difference between, I'm sure you did before, but denotation and connotation. So I'm going to get it to you like this. The five most powerful words, the four most powerful, the three, they add up to 15, OK? The five most powerful words you can ever use with another person, and bonus points if you can use them in a first uh, uh, impression, and super bonus points if you use them in the first 15 seconds of the first impression, are I am proud of you. I'm proud of you. Now, little caveat. It's probably already flashing in your brain. These words come with a little, uh, you know, early warning system. Because we, some people feel that it's not appropriate to say I'm proud of you to other people. Like we're really good at saying I'm proud of you to certain types of people. Who? Kids. Kids, exactly right. I'm proud of you to the little ones. But we're less likely to say I'm proud of you up the org chart. You see? So if you see Denise, or Kara, or Amber in the hallway, you could actually say, thank you for the excellent conference. I'm so proud of you and your team. And they, of course, would look at you and say, I was in the session with you and Michael. <laughs> I know, I know, he told you to tell me that. And then you know what they'll say? Thank you very much. <laughs> because these words work like a charm, man. I'm proud of you. People beam. You know why? They never hear it from anybody else. They don't hear it from their boss. They don't hear it from their spouse or partner at home. So when they hear it from a total stranger, they sign for it like a FedEx package, man. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> the four most powerful words are what is your opinion or what do you think? Now, we are long past the information age. Does anybody know what age we're in right now? It's not highly publicized. We're in the experiential age currently. It happened with Web 2.0. But before the experiential age, we were in the information age. And that was, again, the great equalizer. Everyone had access to the same information. But there's another problem in the medical field, especially among nurse practitioners or doctors or the erudite, the people that have been trained to give you the best expert advice, is you're already supposed to know the friggin' answer. So why would you ever say to a patient, what do you think? <laughs> they want a refund or something, you know, like get this person out of here, she doesn't know what to do. Because the implication is if you say, I don't know, what do you think we should do? The implication is, the inference is you don't have a clue. And so you'll be reluctant. It's risky for you to say it. But I can promise you, everyone likes to be asked their opinion. Everybody wants to, and if you can't ask what do you think, you could say, uh, what is your opinion? We do it with other things, you know, which feels best to you, either or. Give people choices and it, and it empowers them. You know this, right? It's the oldest sales trick in the book, choices. So what is your opinion or uh, what do you think? Uh, what is your opinion is four words. The three most powerful words are will you please. There's the etiquette thing again. The two most powerful words are what? Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. And the single most powerful word you already know 
that you can ever use with another person is that person's name. Now in your business, and even this weekend, we've got some cheat sheets for you. They're called lanyards. <laughs> and people are wearing their favorite word on their person. See if you can find it and use it. Now there's other deep water here. Here's back to the risk again. Names are exotic these days. <laughs> Let's just take the two people closest to me. What is your first name, please? Deborah. Oh, Deborah? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd talk something else. Oh, it's dead. That's not even oh, dead. Dead. <laughs> first, first name? Alicia. Alicia, and it's spelled, I didn't want to know. Yeah, no. <laughs> Other exotic names in the room, shout them out. Who's got an unusual name? What is it? God bless you. <laughs> Other exotic names in the room. I love it. They're all beautiful. What are, come on, I know you've got them. If the person won't give it up, give up the person next to you. <laughs> huh? What is it? Georgia. Georgia. Love it. Love it. And we're seeing unique spellings of names now, which sometimes make them hard to pronounce. It's all good, ladies and gentlemen. Guess what? When somebody's got an unusual name and it forces you to dwell on it, they like that. That's special. It's special. So revel in it. Revel in the fact I can't quite pronounce your name. It's the first time I've seen it. I love it. What is it? And they go, oh, it's, watch, watch their hand. They go, oh, it's, you know. <laughs> my mother gave it to me. She named me after my aunt, you know, and the story comes out, you know. All because you were risked not knowing how to pronounce it. I've done it a million times. And it doesn't always go well. <laughs> but most of the time it does. Okay, so the 15 most powerful words. I also want to do for you the uh, demonstrate, maybe with a little help from the audience, we'll see, uh, seven famous body language postures that either work for you or against you, not only on the job, but also in the hallway at the cocktail hour. So if you, uh, we could get uh, seven volunteers to come up, that would be great. Are you feeling like that? Yeah, come on. I'd love to have you up, come on. We'll start in the steps and we'll just line up right here. We'll also give you a chance if you want to plug your uh, company uh, or talk about yourself or uh, whatever you'd like to do. <laughs> Thank you very much. A round of applause for our contestants. We're in a, uh, we're in a uh, medical industry conference and uh, all of you are super smart people. And you can't count the seven. I know, that's what you said. We can't count. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Got one. Got one. Now we're going to have eight. Yep. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So now we have three, we have seven. seven. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Right. So uh, let's do this. Uh, we'll do one at a time, and I'll dismiss you, Jen. Jen? Yes. I see Jen and Jennifer. Jen, you prefer. Very good. Where are you from? Um, I'm from Livonia, Michigan. Oh, very good. West side of Detroit. And uh, what, you want to plug your company? University of Detroit Mercy. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, the seven body language positions. You understand body language is important. Do you ever, do you ever make guesses about people based on how they're standing? Or... Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> judgment, though, is risky, right? We don't want to judge people too much, but sometimes we're getting clues. Yes. Okay, so we're kind of in that space. So if, if we would, uh, Jen, I'd like you to stand with your hands behind your back. Very good. And this position, ladies and gentlemen, is called parade rest. I know that one of the sponsors was at Air Force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this is, comes from the military, parade rest. And it's a, I told you all of the body language positions have a, a connotation. This is a passive position. So if you're having trouble with a client or patient, this is not the position to use, right? This is passive. <laughs> this says, eat me. <laughs> And we come, come get you. So you never want to do that. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Jim. <laughs> oh, I did. Oh, your last name is Ella Main. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Thank you. Where do you work, Jim? I work for Jackson and Jackson. All right. Welcome. Thank you. It's so nice. I always like it when the exhibitors attend the general sessions. 
I do nurse as well. I'm so I decided I'd come in and listen. Very I heard good. you were very funny, and Allie spoke highly of you. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you did. Nice to So um, let's talk about another body language position yes. for you. Uh, how about hands across the chest? You ever do that? Yeah, some of the, I think we all do it on occasion. Yeah. And this body language position is called attitude. <laughs> <laughs> now, of the three styles, assertive, aggressive, or passive, which one does it seem like it could be? Aggressive. aggressive. Yeah, it could be aggressive. And it's often perceived that way by other people. So if you're with patients and you're trying to develop a trust relationship, this is probably not the, the pose you want to strike. And I know you know that. That's an obvious decision. A round of applause for Deb. <laughs> now, why are you from Marie? Where are you from? St. Joseph, Michigan. Very good. You were the first person to volunteer, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're like an early adopter. <laughs> are you a person that reaches out first often? Are you the person that says, I'm ready, let's go? I think so. Yeah, so you demonstrated it when you said, I'm coming up, right? Okay, so that's cool. Um, so we need a body language position for you. Do you have pockets in your pants? Well, that's good, sweater, good. So the hands in the pockets, not usually a female thing, it's usually a male thing, often accompanied by motion and sound. Okay. Do it with me. Money. <laughs> oh, money. Oh. And what, what signal do you get from this? <laughs> She's like, I gotta go. <laughs> All right, good. Anxious, nervous, uh, not settled in. Uh, and if you're like that all the time, well, how do you make the people around you, right? There was a guy by the name of Jim Rohn who said that we become like the five people we spend the most time with. And I think that's true. We become like the five people we spend the most time with. Some of you are looking at the person next to you. So this is uh, better to have your hands out of your pockets, and we're going to take you to the place where your hands should be in just a second. A round of applause for Kimberly. Hello. Where are you from? Davis, Michigan. Very good. And what, uh, how long have you been in the industry? Oh, my gosh. 35 years? Woo. I don't know. Yeah. How many conferences like this have you been to, this, uh, this particular one? Four. I don't remember. I think it started in 2003 when I was a student nurse. Wow. And then have been the most of them, but not all. All right, a lifelong learner, I love yes. it. Okay, very good. So your hands, leave your hands right where they're at right now. Yeah. This is a body language position. I usually, I usually rock with it. <laughs> okay, stand still for just a second. <laughs> 200 people in the room and I get the thespian. <laughs> so this, this body language position is called the fig leaf. <laughs> and behavioral psychologists say it, uh, it's often perceived as that that person has something to hide or a cover up of some sort. <laughs> no, no, not like that. No, no, not like that. I was speaking metaphorically. Oh. Better to be open, right? You've heard the uh, thing about uh, when you cross your legs and fold up your arms, you know, you go into like turtle yeah. mode, right? It's better to. Yeah, it's especially important in places like job interviews where you're only in front of them for like 20 minutes and they're making instant decisions that they probably shouldn't be making but have to make for risk-reward ratio. Very good. Don't do the fig leaf, will you? Thank you very much. Round of applause for you. You have an exotic name, Mary Lee. Yeah. And it's, and it's all one word. Yes. If people call you Mary, do you get upset? Yeah. <laughs> I would too. Mary Lee, what's your middle name? Lee. It was two words. Say that open please. It was two words, but computers would drop it, and then it would be Mary, and I would sit in waiting rooms because they'd call the wrong name. I'm going to need more time. Okay. <laughs> I hadn't counted on all of this. Right. Yeah. Mary Lee, it's yeah. good to see you. So we covered a few of the uh, body language positions. I want to move now to, uh, let's do this one. So uh, hand, one hand to your chin like this, you can tuck it under an arm like this. Yeah. It's called the thinker pose. You know this? The thinker pose is based on Rodin's statue. The thinker? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I can tell you this, of all the poses I've shown you so far, this is by far the most effective. Because when you do thinker pose when somebody's talking to you, you send them a signal that they are the most fascinating person you have ever met. Wow. 
I use this pose when people are telling me stuff I already know. I use it when they tell me stuff I've heard a million times that day. I said, really? And I'm not faking it. I do think they're very interesting people, but they're not sharing particularly valuable information. And then they lean even more. He likes me, which I do. Which I do. The thinker pose. You can use that. All right, good. Why are you doing that? Think of me. <laughs> You're doing it too. No, your resting pose. Okay, very good. I like that. I know. I'm running out of poses, man. I gotta come up with something now. Let's see. Oh, that's it. That's it. Hands on hips. Both of them. Chest out. This is like Superman. Superwoman. Superhero. Yeah, it's aggressive. She said, we're really pissed. Uh, and this is half a Superman. That usually gets a lot. Aggressive, as I did today. We do it with the kids. And we do it with the dog that's destroyed a roll of toilet paper. Doing it with people, probably asking for a, some sort of a scramble with them. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Hey, where are you from? Muskegon. Did you tell me that already? What company? I am a private pediatrician. I am retired to take care of my granddaughter. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. We saved the best for last. <laughs> Jerry Lynn. Hi, Jerry Lynn. Where do you work? Um, I work, well, I'm with the Board of Health. I work for Spectrum, Spectrum Health, and I uh, also work for Universe. Spectrum is K2? Uh, Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids, okay. And uh, you having a good time so far? Yeah. How many people have you met so far? Um, maybe seven. Okay, not bad. We're gonna up that number in a few minutes with the reception, okay? Okay. All right, very good. So for our final seventh body language position, I just want you to drop your hands at your side. I noticed that behind your back, because that must be a, either a resting position or comfortable for you, yes? Yeah. Okay, now at your side, how do you feel now? Awkward. Yeah, why does it feel awkward? Because I don't really work with my hands. Yeah. And I talk with my hands, and when that talking, it's weird. <laughs> okay. How do, let's let's get another opinion. Do you mind? Yeah. No. Let's get two hundred more opinions. <laughs> How does she look with her hands at her side? Awkward or natural? Natural. You're outvoted. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most natural position of all. And I'll tell you something else. If you're trying to build a relationship with somebody and they're telling you important stuff, you want to hold the pen and you want to write down what they say. I know you do that anyway when you chart. But I do it, I'm not a nurse practitioner, I, I write down what people say all the time. Let me write that down, that's good. They give me a book to read, let me write that down. Movie to see, let me write that down. It helps people feel important, ladies and gentlemen, and we can't do that enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks. A round of applause for all of our contestants. Okay, we are wrapping up. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. We are going, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. I lost you there for a minute. Okay, we're going to do some Q&A here in a second. Um, and I promised you I was going to teach you how to remember names. Are you still interested in that? Yes. Okay. So the technique is called cluster imprinting. And what's cool about this is it's, uh, this is called what they call a manufacturing just-in-time delivery, JIT. Because I'm going to tell you how to do it, and you're going to walk out that door and do it. Do we have a deal? Okay. And you're all going to have fun with this because you, you're going to... Everybody understands you're going to be using the strategy around them. Okay. So uh, it's called cluster imprinting, and it works like this. When somebody tells you their name, the reason you don't remember it is not a memory issue. Uh, or it's not, a, it's not a listening issue, right? You heard it, but you can't remember it. And why can't you remember it? Because you've, your brain is jumbling a bunch of signals at the same time. Perfume, the color they're wearing. Do you like them or not like them? Who else are they standing with? Who did you just talk to? I've got a small plate and a cocktail and a napkin in my hand. This is a dance by itself. A lot of stuff going on. So they say my name is Gugumi, and you, you're, it's lost to the agents, right? Now the problem is, it's a little bit hard for you to go back to that well and say, I'm sorry, can you tell me your name again? That's risky because now they think you're an idiot. So what do we do? We don't use their name the rest of the conversation. <laughs> Good strategy. <laughs> so let's let's put our big girl pants on, our big boy pants on, and let's 
put ourselves out there, and let's say, I know you just probably told me your name a minute ago, but your lanyard's back here, backwards. Can you tell it to me one more time? And now I'm gonna show you the technique to make sure it sticks. Cluster imprinting. Let's say the lady's name is Kathleen. So we're gonna count how many times cluster imprinted, right? I'm gonna cluster her names to my brain. Let's count how many times I can get Kathleen's name to my brain in just a few seconds. I say, what is your name, please? Forget about the lanyard. I say, what is your name, please? She says, my name is Kathleen. That's once. I say, Kathleen, what a fantastic name. Nice to meet you, Kathleen. Is that Kathleen with a K or Kathleen with a C? Look at that, five times. Five times, and I'm just getting started. She doesn't, more importantly, she doesn't think anything of it. It's completely transparent to her, right? She says, it's because she gets asked all the time, Kathleen with a K or a C. The front desk messed that up with her two hours ago. So she says, it's Kathleen with a K. Six, I said, Kathleen with a K, it is. Nice to meet you. And I'm speaking with Renee, right? And I say, uh, Kathleen, have you met Renee? Renee, Kathleen. Nine times now, right? And what do I say to Kathleen before I excuse myself? Nice to meet you, nice to meet you Kathleen. Kathleen. What's that, 10 times? I am never gonna forget Kathleen's name. And now, neither will you. <laughs> I want you to use that technique outside. We'll have some fun with it. I'll be out there with you, listening, encouraging you. Is that okay? Yes. All right, any other questions from the audience? And I know you're ready for cocktails. <laughs> questions about anything we talked about? Did I leave you in any lurch anywhere? Did you miss something? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Funniest damn thing I've heard in a long time. <laughs> I'm buying your first drink. <laughs> Anything else I can do for you today? Did you enjoy yourself? Yes. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you outside. Have a wonderful conference. You good?